And what is the date today? July 2nd, 2024. Oh boy. Damien, what's on your mind this week? Numbers and history are on my mind. Um, came back from vacation last week, so there's been a break. I was in, um, I was in Cape Cod, which is an interesting, beautiful place. I wouldn't think that Massachusetts would have some of those beautiful beaches in the world, but they do. Expensive. They're expensive, beautiful beaches. I think um, there was an item in the Daily Beast today, or yesterday, mm. about how these uh, Cape Cod houses are renting for unsustainable prices and the landlords are really concerned that they can no longer rent out beachfront property for $1,500 a night. Oh my god. They're really concerned. Wow. P-Town. They're like, oh, nobody's willing to pay $1,500 a night. I'm like, yeah, is it a yacht? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's just a room in P-Town. Yeah, it seems a bit much. Um, I had a really relaxing week, but like everybody, I, I watched um, the debate between the president and the uh, candidate for uh, replacing him. And I watched as the Supreme Court continued to roll out new decisions that are that have the force of law in this country. And so I've been thinking about numbers in history. And, and the numbers I'm thinking about specifically are 100. It's been 100 years since the Immigration Act of 1924. And the Immigration of 1924 ushered in the modern immigration system in the United States. We're still dealing with it today. Specifically, it created racial quotas, which were disguised as country-based quotas for immigration. And it put an end for a long time, um, close to 40 years, actually 40 years, to large numbers of immigrants coming to the United States. It resulted in our shameful a shameful period where we did not let in Jewish refugees into the United States before World War II and where it took us actually three years with um, Harry Truman's pressing after World War II to let in the survivors of the Holocaust, the wow. show. We had to take, Harry Truman had to take uh, and push through Congress exceptions to the 1924 Act. It wasn't until 1960s where that all changed. But anyway, it looks like because of this debate um, where we really saw diminished President Biden, mm. yeah. uh, right? I mean, yeah. you, you, just, you, you just saw him and you saw every bit of 81 years plus, you know, lost children and a lost spouse, you know, 81 years plus some real human stress in addition to four years of being a president. Mm. Uh, you saw every bit of it on his face and it just, it doesn't seem to me that he can lead this nation like competently. Everybody says you got administration, whatever, but to me and I think to millions of Americans, we just went, wow, that's, that's not great. And as a result, uh, there's a very strong, increasingly, uh, increasing likelihood that we will see a second Trump administration, which means that the goals of that administration, which are very explicit, which are to stop immigration and go back to a system where we have a 1924 Immigration Act, are likely to be put in, and which leads me to the second number that's floating around in my mind. Um, the second number, which is 1215, June 1215, to be specific, which is uh, when the Magna Carta was issued. And the Magna Carta, when issued, sought to rein in the power of an English despot. And mm. it was one of the foundations of English common law that became one of the foundations of US common law. And there's been an 800 year history with some breaks of creating a legal system that reigns in the power of the autocrat the despot, the king. But we saw another break yesterday, Monday, in which a Supreme Court that's been emboldened by congressional dysfunction, by very deliberate efforts to push forward uh, 
an agenda shaped by different forces, federal society, conservative groups, create a situation where we, we have an executive that now explicitly has been granted by the Supreme Court uh, immunity for something called official acts. Nobody knows what those are. And partial immunity for semi-official acts and no immunity for acts that are not official. And it's all word salad because yeah. we don't know what it means. And now they've sent it back to lower courts to decide what it means. So in fact, until we decide, which could take years, decades, or could never happen, we have an executive that, uh, to something you said, Keith, um, that can say it's legal if a president does it. Yeah. And Do the courts determine does a judge determine what would be official and unofficial? That's right. So it's solely uh, up to the judge. Unless Congress gets their act together okay. and puts forth some definitions. Fortunately, we live in a country where Congress has been at a deadlock at least for 32 years, my full adult life, um, since the Gingrich Revolution in yeah. the early 90s. Effectively, the power is with the courts, and the court knows that. Now, I'll tell you who the other power is with. Who? Oh. The executive. Ah. The president could decide herself or himself, probably himself. You just go best. Based on history, you know, all right. those female presidents we've had. Uh, and so that number's on my mind. It's, it's 1215, June 1215. Magna Carta is issued. In uh, July 1st, 2024, we learned that a president is immune from prosecution for all official acts and some non official acts, even though we don't know what either means. Um, the first number of that was 1924. And then the third number is 40, which might be the most important number actually for us, but it's, it's, it's a boring number. It's 40 years, about how long Chevron, uh, the Chevron Doctrine has been enforced in the United States. And it's this really simple thing. Like it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, but it's a simple thing. The simple idea behind the Chevron Doctrine was that when a U.S. agency, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, or USCIS, Department of Homeland Security, when they make a regulation, a regulation is unlike a law, it's promulgated by an agency, it's supposed to go through a review process, and then effectively becomes like a law, it becomes something you okay. have to follow. Okay, so the, um, a law might be um, the federal government shall control emissions from uh, manufacturers of needs. Right. If you're familiar with your Lorax book from Dr. Seuss, right? We shall, <laughs> we shall, we shall protect the truffle trees, and we shall control emissions from thneeds. Okay. Let's say that's the law. The law is silent on how that will be implemented, and so it'll be up to somebody like the Environmental Protection Agency to say, "Well, I'll tell you how many thneeds an American needs. It's about 562 thneeds per year, and we're going to limit." it to that number so hold on uh, back up we uh, can create a law yeah and not have it enacted in essence we we can create a law that has a law is like a mandate it's like this is what must be done okay. right this is what shall be done this is this is kind of the outer edges of actions that can be done but how that law is actually implemented and enforced we've created increasingly since the roosevelt era federal fdr a system where agencies actually carve out these things called regulations, which are like smaller, more detailed parts of that law. And who determines what law gets distributed by what agency? Yeah, great question. So we say that the executive, which typically has, under the Constitution, has the power to enforce the laws, uh, has delegated its power of enforcement to an agency. And so typically it's bureaucrats, right, bureaucratic folks who are supposed to be experts that, through a system that has a lot of public input, create the regulatory mechanisms that a law is in effect enforced through. Okay. Now, a lot of people don't like this. Specifically, it's been a um, boogeyman of the right. And to be quite honest, as an immigration lawyer, um, it can be quite frustrating to deal with an all-powerful agency. Okay, but Chevron was very simple. It said, hey, you, uh, agencies are going to be deferred to by courts because it's silly for a court to tell the FDA that a certain drug should be put on the market because they have no expertise. It's silly for a court without technical expertise to you know, tell the EPA that 
a certain regulation on how ponds are to be protected from pollutants is not the right way to go about things. The court simply doesn't have the expertise. Therefore, we are going to uh, defer, we the court are going to defer to the EPA or to the DHS or to, to whomever, whatever agency it is, in most cases, right? There's a standard that has to be met for us not to let things sit as they are. The court does away with that. And the, it, things haven't been like this for 40 years. And those three numbers, 1215 Magna Carta, 1924 and 1924 Immigration Act, which limited immigration to the United States based on racial and ethnic quotas, under the cover of country quotas, and 40, which is the number of years that Chevron has uh, been in place, those three numbers are on my mind because they're making me question whether I want to continue being an immigration lawyer. Wow. Chevron is the one that's on my mind the most. Yes, the president is frail, and yes, he looks like he's going to, right now, is on track to lose to somebody who looks less frail, even though they are a complete liar and bozo. And yes, uh, we've empowered our executive, but for right now, we can trust the, for right now, we can trust uh, you know, our current president and all but two of the past presidents, Nixon and Trump, to stay within what has been established as the norms of the presidency, okay? So I can put those to the side in my mind, though, because, uh, number one, Trump might not get elected. We don't know. It's July 2nd. Um, and number two, Congress and the executive itself, through the power of the people, could work to put some real limits on this power because it's alarming. It's alarming to everybody across the spectrum, I think. Chevron is different. How so? Nobody understands Chevron. <laughs> so it's a perfect, it's a perfect way for courts to gain more power because nobody understands it. No matter how many people yell, the administrative state no longer has power. It's now in the courts. Most people don't get that. But here's the thing that it leads to, in my, it can lead to, in my opinion, and using words that people don't understand, it can lead to secession of states and regions without the need to call for secession. And, and the reason it can do that is because what Chevron created was standardization across the entire United States as to how federal laws would be implemented. One of the motivating factors behind Chevron was to say, hey, we don't want 11 different circuit courts creating 11 different types, uh, 11 different versions of an EPA regulation that will lead to chaos. Well, now we're in a situation where every federal circuit court can and will, we can count on it, create different versions of regulations. I'll give you an example. The Fifth Circuit, very hyper-conservative um, to a radical extent, is sure to allow anybody who wants to challenge EPA regulations to do so. And if the Fifth Circuit rules against certain EPA reg regulations, waters them down, then that will be that version, that watered down version, or that slashed version, or that non-version mm. of the EPA will be law wherever the Fifth Circuit has purview. Whereas in the Second Circuit, so I'm in the Second Circuit in Connecticut. And where's the Fifth Circuit? We need a map, but Texas is in the Fifth Circuit. Okay. Okay. Second Circuit, where I'm at here in uh, New England, they're going to have much stronger versions of those EPA laws, maybe as the EPA intends them under a pro-EPA administration, right? Or even if we have a weaker EPA, so let's say you have a Trump presidency, which is, and the Trump incoming Trump uh administration, you know, has already signaled they want to weaken the EPA, they want to weaken the proliferation of wind power turbines, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the Second Circuit could still, could then uh, strengthen the EPA's own regulatory instincts, you see? So what it allows, it allows regions, but not really states, but regions under the circuits to uh, strengthen or weaken certain regulations as they see fit. Over time, this is gonna create 
not like nominally different states where it's really funny that people in North Carolina where I, I spent a lot of time have like a certain kind of accent and it's really funny that you know anybody sounds like a Kennedy up here in Northeast that's not going to be like the regional difference it's not going to be like buffalo wings versus shredded pork uh, it's not going to be you know cowboy hats in Texas uh, versus mullets in North Carolina versus uh, you know Italian steroided up men here in Connecticut. It's going to be fundamentally different countries because we fundamentally fundamentally different realities on something other than the internet. You know you're gonna have very strong abortion rights up in Connecticut not in Texas as we've already seen. Right. You're gonna have very clean lakes up in New England and perhaps not so clean ones down in other places. But this is going to repeat itself across the many different purviews of agencies that exist. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe, maybe you know, um, de jure secession as opposed to de facto secession. Right? De jure, or rather de facto secession as opposed to de jure secession, right? De jure is secession by law, by proclamation. De facto is something just happens, right? Maybe that keeps our country together a little longer, but for me as an immigration lawyer, it's uh, creating a reality where I'm not going to be able to practice nationally. I don't think I'm going to be able to understand all the circuit's you know, feelings towards certain immigration policies all the time. And so even if Trump didn't get elected, Chevron becomes a really big problem. Now, when you say yeah. Chevron, just to be clear, we're not talking about the company. We're talking about the law related to... Co correct. The, the case is called Chevron and, and it's just been overruled. That's sure. right. But with um, the very real possibility, I think likelihood, as of right now, that uh, there would be a second Trump administration, it's a complete death blow to immigration. It's a complete death blow because you have a completely powered, empowered executive, free from impunity, because all official acts are now protected, and nobody knows what an official act is. And you have an administration that's looking to turn off any entry through borders that's looking to dismantle immigration and now has the powers because of the overturning of Chevron to freely dismantle the administrative state and throw things, throw, throw the biggest wrench in the history of wrenches into, into a system that's already overburdened. I remember working as an attorney from 2016 to 2020. It was a really hard experience. Uh, for immigrants, their families, advocates, and attorneys. It was, by the 2020, it was, even before COVID, it was, it was a struggle to work with agencies. I think this will be a death blow to immigration practice. And um, if it happens, I'm going to continue with this practice as long as possible, hmm. but I might become a full con time content creator, I might go to writing, I might go into personal injury law. Uh, there's going to be some sort of transition. Uh, what I'm not willing to do is spend another four years, quote unquote, fighting this as a vanguard, which is what immigration lawyers were totally up for in 2016. And I say immigration lawyers because I don't think I'm the only one. Definitely in conversations with colleagues, whether nonprofits, private practice, this is a sentiment that's shared. So that's what's in my mind.